Okay, so, all right. Good to see you guys again, or good to be seen by you. Uh, we are going to spend our session really focusing on Solomon. Uh, here's our timeline up here. You can see a little bit where Solomon fits in the timeline. So Solomon is the third king of Israel. And I want, to, to, want you to recall David, uh, that David was the one who took the throne after Saul. David is known for trust, but especially David is known for God's promise to him. And that promise was not simply that he would be king, but that he would have a dynasty and that he wouldn't fail to have a son on the throne. And even more, God had promised David that your son will be as a son to me and I will be as a father to him. And so this father-son relationship between David's line and God. And so that each successive generation where one of David's sons takes the throne, when he steps into that office as king, he is basically stepping into the role as son of God. And I think we talked about this, son not in terms of becoming divine, but son in terms of having the authority and the responsibility to execute God's will, God's justice, God's righteousness on earth, especially over God's people, but also over all people. So that's the promise to David, that's huge. So from David's side, he's marked by trust. And we saw that sometimes he, uh, well, even when he sins, and he sinned big, as we recall, yet when he was confronted with his sin, he trusted himself back to God. And so David marked by trust, but the most important thing is God's promise to him of this dynasty and that your son will be as a son to me and I will be as a father to him. And now we move on to Solomon. And Solomon was the second son of Bathsheba. And so David promised Bathsheba that Solomon would reign in his place uh, when he was old, when he passed. And so if you turn with me to 1 Kings, you can begin to see all of this play out in chapter 1. And then let's go ahead and go to chapter 2. So chapter 1 is a story of Solomon coming to the throne. And then chapter 2 is David's words of advice to Solomon. So I want to call your attention to this, uh, 1 Kings chapter 2. When David's time to die drew near, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Be strong and show yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn, that the Lord may establish his word that is spoken concerning me saying, if your sons pay close attention to their way, to walk before me in faithfulness with all their hearts and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Okay, I hope you heard that, and especially those parts about keep the charge of the Lord your God, walk in the ways of the Lord, keep his statutes, his commandments, his rules, his testimonies, as is written in the law of Moses kind of reminds you a little bit of what God said to Joshua before they were entering into the promised land. Do everything that Moses commanded you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left. Basically, that's what David is telling Solomon, that he is to do everything that Moses commanded, that he's to keep all the statutes, all the commandments that God gave through Moses, this book of the covenant. In fact, I should have probably directed you here sooner but turn with me back to Deuteronomy, back to Deuteronomy chapter 17. And here we get Moses' words regarding what kind of a king they should have when they want a king. So Deuteronomy chapter 17, and I'll pick it up at verse 14. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. Only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away 
nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priest. And it shall be with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. Okay, and so you hear what, what Moses is saying. Number one, that the king is not to acquire for himself excessive amounts of silver or gold, not to acquire chariots and horses, not to take an excessive number of wives, lest they lead his heart astray. And most of all, what the king is supposed to do is write down the Book of the Covenant. The king is to write it. The king is to know it, to meditate on it. The king is to lead the people in keeping covenant, keeping Torah. So the king is not above the law. The king is to be the one that leads the people in following everything that Moses commanded. And he cannot put himself above the people. He cannot put himself above the people in terms of being under the law that Moses gave. So we see Moses giving that. We see God basically speaking that to Joshua. And now we hear David telling that to Solomon as Solomon is coming into full power uh, with, his, with his kingdom. We go a little bit further uh, into chapter 2, and we read where David dies and Solomon establishes his throne. And so go with me to the very end of chapter 2, and this is going to kind of feed over into chapter 3. So all the way to chapter 2, very end of it, the very last line. So the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. Okay, and so chapter 2, it's a story of Solomon making sure that he's in charge of everything, and the kingdom is firmly established in his hand now. Look at the first thing that we learn that the narrator tells us about as we go into chapter 3. Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had finished building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. Okay, I hope you got that. It's really interesting to me that once the kingdom is firmly established in Solomon's hands, the first thing that the narrator tells us about, I don't know that this is the first thing that Solomon did, but it's the first thing that the narrator tells us about, is that Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took one of Pharaoh's daughters to be his wife. Now I ask you, good thing, bad thing, what's the upside of it? I'm sure you're thinking right now that the upside is if Pharaoh is his father-in-law, then he has access to all the resources of Egypt. And he doesn't have to worry about Pharaoh attacking him as long as he treats his daughter right. And so it looks like a really, really great move for the stability, for the future of his kingdom. He's able to make an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, doesn't have to worry about Egypt or Pharaoh as a threat, and in fact gains access to all of those resources. So that's the upside. What's the downside? Well, the downside is not only do you get Pharaoh as your father-in-law, you get, yeah, you get all of the access, the access to all of Pharaoh's resources, but the downside is now you are in alliance with the gods of Pharaoh as well. See, if you make an alliance, if you enter into marriage, and marriage was very much an alliance, when you entered into a marriage alliance, you not only got access to resources, now you're part of the family, and that means you get the family's gods. So this is going to prove, kind of a spoiler alert, this is going to prove incredibly detrimental to Solomon, because in this alliance, he doesn't just get Pharaoh's daughter, he doesn't just get Pharaoh's resources, he ends up with Pharaoh's gods. Well, kind of a spoiler alert there, we go on. Verse 3, again, this is, this is kind of baffling to me. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father, 
only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places. And he's at a high place, he's at Gibeon, and the Lord appears to him. Uh, we read it a little bit further, verse 5, At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon says, basically, down to verse 9, Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? And so the Lord is pleased with Solomon. The Lord shows up to Solomon. Solomon asks whatever you would like. And instead of asking for wealth or power, uh, Solomon says, man, I need, I need the ability to govern this people well, that this is going to be a challenging job. So he's basically asking for wisdom. And God decides to give it to him. It pleased the Lord that Solomon asked for this. So God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for your long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall rise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all his servants. And so the Lord was very pleased with Solomon's request. The Lord grants Solomon wisdom, and Solomon is known to be wise like no one else. And then he says, I'm going to give you wealth. I'm going to give you long life. I'm going to uh, give you a strong kingdom. But you got to walk in the ways of David. You got to do everything that Moses commanded. The next story, really popular story with Solomon, kind of proves his wisdom. It's the story about the, the two women. Each of them have a baby. And one, one falls asleep on her baby. The baby suffocates. And then they swap babies, or the mother of the dead baby takes the live baby from the other woman uh, while she's asleep, places her dead baby there. And now they awake, and they're both arguing about who does a lot, who does a live baby belong to. Both are claiming the live baby. And Solomon says, "Okay, here's how I'll make the decision. Bring me a sword. He's going to cut the baby in half so that they can each have half the baby. You guys know the story." The, the true mom says, no, she can have him. And the mom who is stuck in grief over the loss of her own baby, she's content to have the baby cut in half so that the other mom is stuck with the same grief she is. And so Solomon recognizes right away that it's the true mom who wants the baby to live, even if she doesn't get to keep the baby. And so he awards the baby to the true mom. Everybody's talking about Solomon's wisdom. Well, what we're going to do here is we are going to kind of just skim through Solomon's story. And so I'll highlight some stuff as we go. Um, but the best way I know how to get at this is to just kind of lead you through it, kind of skimming our way through. I want to call your attention to a few things. So first place we're going to go is into chapter 4 and all the way down to verse 22. So 1 Kings 4.22. Solomon's provision for one day was 30 cores of fine flour, 60 cores of meal, 10 fat oxen, 20 pasture-fed cattle, 100 sheep besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fat and fowl. And then it tells all about how he had dominion over all the land, and everyone had their own vine, their own fig tree. Uh, it was a time of peace and productivity. Verse 26, Solomon also had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And those officers supply provisions for King Solomon and for all who came to King Solomon's table, each one in his month. They let nothing be lacking. Barley also and straw for the horses and swift steeds they brought to the place where it was required, each according to his duty. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding beyond all measure and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore. So that Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the people of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. And we read about how he spoke 3,000 proverbs, etc. 
So I want you to see the uh, incredible wealth that he had, the luxurious lifestyle. Well, let's go on. Uh, chapter five, Solomon had a lot of building projects. And so we go down to 513, 513. King Solomon drafted forced labor out of all Israel. And the draft numbered 30,000 men. And he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in ships. They would be a month in Lebanon and two months at home. So he drafted labor, forced labor. And once every three months, you're going to spend a month in Lebanon, basically helping get the timbers that were needed for Solomon's building projects. Let's go to chapter six. Chapter six is the story of Solomon building the temple. It was an incredible structure. Last line of chapter six, he was seven years in building it. So the temple was a seven year building project. We go to chapter seven, very next line, Solomon was building his own house 13 years and he finished his entire house. So the temple, a seven year building project, his palace, a 13 year project. Uh, we go on, we get furnishings about the temple and finally they bring the Ark of the Covenant into the temple. And now I'm in chapter eight and Solomon has this long prayer of dedication. Basically summarizing the prayer, Solomon says, Lord, we know that you are too big, too mighty, too awesome to dwell within this temple. But when we pray to this place, would you hear from heaven and respond to our prayers? That when we seek you here with all of our heart, will you answer our cries? Will you forgive us our sins? Will you be with us as we deal with our enemies? Uh, will you forgive us? And even when an outsider who is sojourning amongst Israel, when they come here and pray and seek you with all their heart, would you hear their prayers and grant their request? And so Solomon is, is confessing that, Lord, you are too great. You cannot be contained within a building, within this temple, this house. But would you, would you take note of us here? And when we seek you here, would you hear from heaven and would you respond to us? And in chapter 9, the Lord responds to Solomon's prayer. And so this is the second time that the Lord appears to Solomon. So chapter 9, verse 1, as soon as Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to build, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea, which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you will walk before me, as David your father walked, with integrity of heart and uprightness doing, according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. But if you turn aside from following me, you or your children, and do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them, and the house that I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight. And Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples, and this house will become a heap of ruins. Okay, I hope you got that. That God is making this incredible promise to Solomon that yes, my name will be there, I'll watch over the temple, uh, you'll seek me, you'll find me, I'll hear from heaven, you got my attention, and I'm with you. And if you walk in my ways, if you do everything that was commanded in my statutes, then I will follow through on this dynasty, you will, you will know my blessing. But if you break covenant, I'll tear this place down that if you disobey the statutes, then I will not leave one stone on another. This incredible project that you've made for me, I'll tear it down. So it's a promise, but it's a conditional promise, and the condition is covenant keeping. By the way, I hope that you're thinking Deuteronomic theology, that that's what we're seeing all across here. It says Deuteronomic theology, that you are to do everything I command, and if you do that, then you, you live into God's blessings. 
But if you don't do that, then you come under curse. And the ultimate curse we just read, I'll cast this place out of my sight and I'll tear this place down. It will become a heap of ruins. Okay, and that's going to spell expulsion, exile. All right, well, we keep going. We keep going. But just remember that promise to Solomon about the temple. So now I'm still in chapter 9, verse 15. And this is the account of the forced labor that King Solomon drafted to build the house of the Lord and his own house and the millow and the wall of Jerusalem and Hazor and Megiddo and Gezer. Uh, let's see, we go on. And all the store cities that Solomon had had and the cities for his chariots and the cities for his horsemen and whatever Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem and Lebanon and in all the land of his dominion, all the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites were not of the people of Israel. Their descendants who were left after them in the land, whom the people of Israel were unable to devote to destruction, these Solomon drafted to be slaves, and so they are to this day. But of the people of Israel, Solomon made no slaves. They were the soldiers, they were his officials, his commanders, his captains, his chariot commanders, and his horsemen. Now, did you just get that? What did Solomon do with all of the foreigners that were still living in the midst of the people of Israel? He enslaved them and used them for his building projects. The Israelites, he drafted them and made them soldiers. Well, we go on. Uh, chapter 10, Solomon's great wealth, down at verse 14. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon one year was 666 talents of gold. Besides that which came from the explorers and from the business of the merchants, and from all the kings of the West and from the governors of the land. King Solomon made 200 large shekels of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went into each shekel. He made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three minas of gold went into each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. The king also made a great ivory throne and overlaid it with the finest gold. The throne had six steps, and at the back of the throne was a calf's head. And on each side of the seat were armrests and two lions standing beside the armrest while 12 lions stood there, one on each end of the step on the six steps. The like of it was never made in any kingdom. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. Silver was not considered as anything in the days of Solomon. For the king had a fleet of ships of Tarshish at sea with the fleet of Hiram, and they bring in various animals. Uh, King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and wisdom. Uh, verse 26, Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots, 12,000 horsemen, whom he stationed in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. And silver was made as common as stone. Well, you get the picture. Oh, and he got the horses from Egypt. Question, who does Solomon look like to you? Who does he most resemble? Does he resemble his father, David? Or does he resemble his father-in-law, Pharaoh? See, this is kind of a tragic thing, is for all of Solomon's wisdom, he doesn't really reflect David. He doesn't really keep the Torah. That what he ends up doing is looking more like Pharaoh in terms of his wealth, in terms of making slaves out of the foreigners in their midst, in terms of the building projects that he has. He doesn't, he doesn't keep the ways of the Lord. And it's, it's really interesting to me when you think about Deuteronomy 17 and you think about what we've been reading and who's reading this. Remember, this is part of the Deuteronomic history. And so there would be a tendency of the exiles to remember back to, you know, those glory days that they heard about with Solomon, those glory days when there was peace, those glory days when the money was flowing, when silver was so common and the temple was so uh, outrageously beautiful, gold everywhere. There would be a tendency to remember back, remember those days as kind of the, the golden days, the good days. But I wonder if the narrator is trying to help them think differently. Without actually condemning Solomon, 
at the same time using this report of his wealth as a way to really kind of put him on trial, really kind of say maybe those days weren't so good because the assumption is that the people who are reading this also know Deuteronomy 17. And all of a sudden, instead of these being such good days, what's becoming more and more apparent is that Solomon wasn't following Torah. That Solomon wasn't doing all that Moses commanded and that he was getting rather caught up in a Pharaoh type lifestyle rather than a covenant lifestyle where you simply use your power to amass more and more and more. The narrator doesn't ever condemn him for this. The narrator just reports it. And I suspect the narrator is trying to raise the question, were these really the good days? Not going to make that decision for the reader. The reader is going to have to decide that. But were these really that good of days? Was Solomon setting us up for greater failure because he wasn't walking in the ways of Moses, even though he had so much going for him? Well, now we go to chapter 11. Now, King Solomon, King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord has said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites, so Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not wholly follow the Lord as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemish, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the Ammonites, on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And so he did for all his foreign wives who made offerings and sacrifice to their gods. And so the Lord is incredibly frustrated with Solomon. And so what the Lord says is he's going to tear away the kingdom from Solomon. Now, again, it's important for us to remember that in marriage, you don't just get your spouse, and you don't just get the resources of your spouse's family. You get their gods. And so Solomon built the Lord a temple, but then he also built temples, worship sites, worship centers, for the gods of his foreign wives. And because he did this, his heart was turned astray to where he was no longer worshiping the Lord alone. See, that's the thing about David. He worshiped the Lord alone, no other gods. He sinned, yes, but he never turned to other gods. But Solomon wasn't like David. He was like his father-in-law. And he worshiped other gods not only building a temple for the Lord, but building temples, worship sites, worship centers for the gods of his foreign wives. Pretty interesting, right? Solomon's got the kingdom firmly established. And the first thing we read about is taking Pharaoh's daughter to be his wife. We read about all that he did, including the building of the temple. And then we read about his wives and building worship sites for their gods. And so the last thing is how the kingdom is going to be taken from him that had been so firmly established. And what God says is that the kingdom is going to be ripped away from Solomon for worshiping other gods, but out of faithfulness to David, God says, I'm not going to take it away from you in your lifetime, and I'm not going to take the whole thing from you. I'm going to leave you one tribe, the tribe of Judah. So when you think about Solomon, when you think about Solomon, I know that you're going to think about wisdom. 
that the Lord had promised him wisdom. He asked for wisdom the first time the Lord appeared to him. The Lord granted him that wisdom. I don't think Solomon used that wisdom wisely, but it's obvious the Lord granted him wisdom. The second thing you're going to think about is not only did he get wisdom, but he got wealth. And like nobody had ever seen, like nobody had ever experienced. Third thing, I know what you're thinking, and you're right, he got women. Pharaoh's daughter, 700 wives, princesses, all those are alliances with other peoples, with other families, trying to gain more and more wealth, more and more resources. The 300 concubines, those were probably Jewish girls. But the 700, they turned his heart astray to other gods. And so we already see that he is not keeping covenant in terms of his wealth, in terms of how he used his wisdom, but they especially brought in other gods and he worshiped them. He made worship available to them. He basically institutionalized the worship of other gods within Israel. And so because of this, the kingdom will be divided. God's going to divide it, pull it from him, but not in his lifetime. And again, God's not going to take the whole kingdom. He's going to leave the tribe of Judah. But the rest of Israel to the north. So these are the aspects of Solomon that we remember. Um, summarize it. He looks more like Pharaoh than he does like David. As important as all this stuff is that we just walked through, again, I cannot emphasize it enough that the most important thing about Solomon, though, is the temple. And really, it's not because of Solomon, but it's because of God's promise. God's promise to David was that your son will build me a house and I will make you into a house. And so we see David's house continuing here. And we see that David's son Solomon built the house for the Lord, the temple. And then we have this incredible promise that my name will be there. I'll watch over that place. When you seek me with all your heart there, I'll hear from heaven and I'll respond. And so God is promising his attention and his presence with Israel. So think Solomon, think all this stuff. But the most important thing is the temple. And I'll get Pharaoh out of there. The most important thing is the temple. Now, I know what you're wondering. You want to know, okay, how did, how did it come about that the kingdom actually split if it didn't happen in Solomon's lifetime? Well, let me walk you through this real quick. This won't take super long. But Solomon's son, and I'll put his name up here. So Solomon's son, his name is Rehoboam. So Solomon's son, Rehoboam, comes to power about 930. And what happens is, is that the people come to Rehoboam and they say, look, your father Solomon, he ruled this with a really heavy hand. He was harsh in his taxation, his conscripted labor, if you will go easy on us, if you, you will lighten up on the taxes, lighten up on being so heavy handed, then we'll be loyal to you and we'll listen to you and we'll follow you and you will be our king. Rehoboam said, give me three days to think about it. And so the people go away and he's thinking about it and he asks Solomon's advisors. And Solomon's advisors tell him, yeah, your father was really heavy handed, cruel. If you will show some love to the people, if you will lighten up on the taxation, then they will be loyal to you and you will have them your entire kingdom. And he said, well, let me ask my peers. And so Rehoboam asked his peers and his peers said, no, you gotta be tougher than your father. That you gotta have a heavier hand than your father. And you gotta show them that you're the man now. Well, Rehoboam decided to listen to his peers. And so when the people came back, the delegations from the other tribes came back, he said, look, you thought my father was heavy handed? 
you haven't seen anything yet that my hands are heavier than my father's. And when the people heard this, they rebelled against him and they made a guy by the name of Jeroboam. Made a guy by the name of Jeroboam their king. And so Jeroboam becomes the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. It's got about 10 tribes. And Rehoboam is the king of the southern kingdom, Judah, where Jerusalem is at, where the temple is at. And that's how the kingdom ended up dividing. So for the theological reason the kingdom divided was because of Solomon's sins of worshiping other gods, building other temples uh, or worship centers, worship sites for those gods. And so God says, because you did this, then I'm taking the kingdom away from you, but not in your lifetime and not the whole thing. And then how it happened politically was Rehoboam's foolishness, announcing to the people that he was going to be even harsher than his father. And they rebelled against him and the kingdom split 930. And we end up with Jeroboam in the north and Rehoboam in the south. All right, well, I'm gonna shut this one down and then uh, erase the board a little bit. And I wanna talk just a little bit more about First and Second Kings, and then we will be done, I think, with our Deuteronomic history. So see you in just a bit, or be seen by you in just a bit.